We've come to our fifth and final message on the flesh, how to overcome the flesh. In our first session together, we thought about what the flesh is, and it is in a corrupt nature that we all inherited from Adam. It's passed down from generation to generation, and it wars against the spirit. Uh, just because we're born again in Christ doesn't mean that that nature is removed. It will be a glorification um, or death, obviously, but uh, our new body will not have that corrupt nature that wants its own way, that wants to defy the will of God. In our second session, we looked at 1 Samuel 15, and we looked at the behavior of the flesh and studying the behavior of King Saul, one of the three archetypes of the flesh in the Old Testament. The second archetype is Ishmael, the false son of Abraham, the son that was born in the strength and wisdom of the flesh. Abraham didn't consult the Lord. Uh, he just followed his wife Sarah's counsel and took Hagar as a concubine and Ishmael was born. And we saw five ways of overcoming the impulses of the flesh in that chapter. Then our previous study together, we were in Exodus 16, and we thought together about four things that the flesh hates. And just a quick review, the flesh does not like testing, but testing is absolutely necessary to refine and mature the believer. The flesh wants to get us looking down and back. If we do, we'll be uh, complainers, murmurers against God. But if we're looking forward in expectation of what God will do, and we're looking upward into the character and attributes of a loving, good God, then we're going to go through life joyfully. We also saw that the flesh does not like the spiritual man to eat spiritual food. Rather, it would have it feed on what the world would have us to think on, ponder, meditate on. But we need God's word. We need to meditate on it. We need to memorize it. Should be center in our homes. And everything that's in the home should reflect the Lord Jesus Christ and his lordship. And then fourthly, we saw that the flesh doesn't like us to remember the goodness of God. And so we should write things down, uh, answers to prayer, things that are statistically impossible and are clearly the hand of God in our lives. So we don't forget because when we're discouraged, it's easy to forget God's goodness and the flesh doesn't want to us to remember the past goodness of God. So this brings us to our final session together on the flesh. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 17. So we're going to be looking at God's grand program for dealing with the flesh. We're picking up from where we left off in our last session and chapter 17 verse 1, then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt or test the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you the elders of Israel also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock and the water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the children of Israel, because they tempted or tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? You might recall from our last session together, we saw that the Hebrew word for murmuring and complaining, it's the highest concentration of murmuring and complaining in Scripture, Exodus 16, 
uh, was mild at the start, but if we don't keep in check our lusting, our complaining gets worse and worse. Our dissatisfaction gets worse and worse. And by the time we get into chapter 17, it's a very strong word. Strife is translated into English. So much so Moses is fearing for his life. Now, God has already tested his people in the area of water. You might recall that in chapter 15, they had come across the Red Sea. They come in the wilderness. He brought them to Mara, where there was water, but it was bitter and they couldn't drink. And they'd gone three days without water and they were thirsty, rightly so. And the Lord's solution was to throw a particular tree into the water and make the waters sweet or drinkable. And it's a beautiful picture of the cross of Christ. Well, here we are again now, a few weeks later, there's been no mention of water since the wells at Elam. And God is testing his people again in this matter of water. You need water to live. If you don't have water, you die. And so the people have a legitimate need. And often God is going to be testing us not in the areas of uh, where we might be lusting or longing for something that we don't really shouldn't have, but in areas of, of, of life that we really do have necessities that need to be satisfied. And water is one of those. This is often God's method in life. He will bring us into one area of our life to refine it, test it, challenge us. And as we rest in him, in faith, obey his word, go on with him, he gets us through the trial. And about the time that we just get comfortable, he'll bring us into another challenge. And it's greater than the previous one. And so he's expanding us through these progressive trials. It's kind of like a balloon. You blow it up and it's very uncomfortable when it, things are stretching. But once the uh, balloon is not expanding anymore, it gets comfortable. And we get comfortable when we have these little intermissions of God's uh, testing us. And just about the time we get comfortable, God says, well, I want more out of you. And so he expands us again. It's uncomfortable, but we went on with the Lord the first time he got us through it. And so he's, he's increasing our capacity to bring him honor and glory. He's making us like the Lord Jesus through these progressive trials that often will get harder. So just because God has tested you one area of your life and you were victorious, don't be surprised if he comes back again and tests you in that same area. Well, God had a solution. His people were complaining and they were in strife, uh, questioning the goodness of God. Uh, he just brought us out here for us to die in the wilderness. How many times have they already said that? And God keeps proving himself faithful. So again, God has a solution for Moses. And again, it's going to typify the work and the fruitfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry. And he tells Moses to take the rod, which you struck the river. That means it was his shepherding rod. It was the rod in which uh, Moses holds over the Amalekites later in this chapter, showing God's authority. A rod speaks of authority. It's the rod in which the ten plagues of Egypt were executed. And so the rod expresses God's authority over the situation. And God told Moses to take this specific rod to a specific rock in Horeb and to strike the rock. After striking the rock, the water would come forth from the, the rock and the people would be able to drink and not perish. And so that's exactly what Moses did. He strikes the rock and water comes forth and provides for God's people. Now, the rock pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of the symbols that is often applied to the Lord Jesus. He's the cornerstone that was rejected in Psalm 118. Daniel calls him the smiting stone that will bring down all the Gentile rule in a future day. 
And then that grows up to be a great mountain, which pictures a kingdom. Uh, the Lord said, you have two choices. You can fall upon me, a rock, and humble yourselves and fall on me and be saved, or he will come and crush uh, the wicked into powder, speaking of his judgment. He, he's a stumbling stone for the nation of Israel. Uh, in Matthew 16, he's a foundational stone for the church. And so the Lord is often uh, pictured as a rock in scripture. And here we have the rock that is going to give life, life giving water. And so Moses strikes it, speaks of God's authority in striking the rock. Uh, it was God was in complete authority at Calvary when he struck his son, punished him for our sins. And from that finished work, the life-satisfying water was made available to any thirsting soul who would take it by faith. And so the Lord Jesus actually speaks of this scene in John chapter 7. So let's turn there in our Bibles. So in John chapter 7, verse 37, we're picking up now towards the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. This would be about um, six months before the Lord would be crucified. He says in verse 37, on the last day, this would be the eighth day of the feast. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Lord makes a statement corresponding to a Jewish tradition. Uh, the priest, sometimes a high priest, but an entourage of priests would go down to the spring of Gahan from the temple. Uh, they would take a gold pitcher, and they would scoop up water out of the spring of Gahan, and they would go back up the hill to the temple. Uh, they would climb the steps, and they would pour the, the water out before the altar, probably ran down the steps of the temple. And that was to remind Israel how God provided for them in the wilderness. When Moses struck the rock, the water came forth and sustained them, or they would have perished. And so the Lord is saying... They did this, by the way, uh, seven days, but on the eighth day, they didn't do that. The priest didn't go down the spring of Gohan. That's when the Lord Jesus stands up. He says, um, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. He was the rock. He was the one that would be struck by God, the authority of God, in order that we might drink of him. He calls the the everlasting water, the living water to the Samaritan woman in John chapter four. And he says to her, if you drink of me, you'll never have to drink again. And so this is spiritually satisfying water, satisfies our soul, gives us eternal life. And the Lord Jesus says, if you, if you trust me, you drink of me, there'll be rivers of water that will flow out of your heart, not a river, but rivers speaking of the, the full work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as a result of drinking the living water of, of, that Christ offers. So back in chapter 17, we have this lovely picture of Moses striking the rock once and the water coming out just as God said. Now, jump ahead 40 years, almost 40 years, when the children of Israel were done wandering and God was going to lead them around the southern part of Edom up through the Transjordan. Again, they're running out of water and they're murmuring and complaining against Moses and Aaron. And it displeased them. They were frustrated with the people. And so God says, well, I have a solution. There's a particular rock and I want you to go to that rock and speak to the rock and the rock will give forth water for the people to drink. But because of their frustration with the people, Moses takes uh, Aaron's rod and strikes the rock 
twice. Now, Aaron's rod was the one that it was the priestly rod. It was the one that was put in the tabernacle with other rods and Moses bring, brought the rods, one from each tribe out in the morning. It was a tribe of Levi, Aaron's rod that had budded and produced almonds. It was a fruitful, what was dead was now fruitful and alive. It speaks of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he's our high priest. And that rod was before the Lord. And so in Numbers 20, God tells Moses, take the rod that's before the Lord, before my covenant. That's Aaron's rod, not Moses' rod. And so it's hard to imagine Moses taking this rod, perhaps it was still full of blossoms and almonds, and beating the rock with it. The idea that God wanted to show is that Christ is in heaven now and that his people speak to him as high priest. He has risen from the dead. He's a living rod. He's a living priesthood. And 24-7, we can go into his presence. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16 tells us, receive help in time of need. And so we speak to the Lord. He'll never suffer again at Calvary. He'll never come under the judgment of God again for our sin. And so when Moses took Aaron's rod and struck the rock twice, God went ahead and provided water from the rock but he also would punish Aaron and Moses for their disobedience. They broke the tithe. Christ is never to be judged again. And it angered the Lord. God provided for his people. So it's important to understand there were two rock incidents. One, the first one, Moses uses his rod, speaking of God's authority, to strike the rock, speaking of the work of Christ at Calvary uh, for the judgment of sin. That the next time the rock was to show the priesthood of Christ, that he had raised from the dead, that he was in heaven, and that he was the eternal priest. And all we do now is talk to the Lord in order to get that blessing. But Moses broke the type. So we'll move now from the devotional content of this chapter and get into the practical aspect. I want to share with you six points of God's dealing with the flesh. Um, he has programmed for dealing with the flesh kind of his grand blueprint for dealing with the flesh. We read in verse 8, it says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Well, who is Amalek? Well, you might recall we already discussed Amalek back in our study in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Amalek was a grandson of Esau. Esau was a carnal man. He lived for the moment. He didn't live for the future. Esau didn't prize his birthright. He sold it for a bowl of bean soup. He lived for the moment. He was hungry, and so he just wanted to eat. He didn't care about the future ramifications of selling his birthright to Jacob. And God was going to give it to Jacob anyway. Jacob didn't have to get Esau to sell it to him. The Malachites, all the way from the days of Abraham until uh, even in the days of the kings, were people that represented the flesh. They were constantly at war with Israel. And we hear of them coming north now. In the wintertime, they went to the southern portion of the Sinai Peninsula with their herds and flocks. And then as temperatures started rising in late spring, they would head back north and go into the highlands in order to graze their flocks and herds. And as they're coming north, they meet what they feel are two million trespassers in their land. Really wasn't their land, but that's the way they felt. And this is one of the first points that we want to think together about is that God does not recognize the perceived rights of the flesh. How often has road rage or a fight broke out because someone cut in line, someone got cut off in traffic, um, you know, we get angry because someone cuts in front of us and, and delays us by 10 seconds. <laughs> and, and, and people have died because of road rage and something that started out very trivial, but their flesh blew it up because they, they perceived that their rights have been violated and uh, they didn't want anyone else getting the benefit of something that they had lost. Of course, Abraham shows us a great example in Genesis 13 of putting aside our rights in order that there might be peace. He had the title deed to the whole land of Cana, but because 
they had come out of Egypt, Lot and Abraham, with so much riches, they had trouble getting along now. Their herdsmen had trouble getting along. There was friction among the brethren. And that grieved Abraham that the, the local inhabitants would see friction among the Hebrews. And so he tells Lot, you just pick whichever way you want to go and I'll go the other way. Lot looks up with his eyes and he sees Sodom. It reminded him of his Egypt and he says, that's what I want. And that's where he went and he ended up losing everything, which is what happens when a believer becomes carnal and invests in the world. They end up losing everything. It doesn't count for eternity. But Abraham sacrificed his rights in order to bring peace. And it's a, a godly thing for us to do. The Malachites felt that there were trespassers. And so we read in Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 18, Moses is recounting this 40 years later. He says, remember what the Malachites did when we came out of Egypt? They snuck around on the backside and they attacked the stragglers, the weak of the Israelites, the, the weary ones that couldn't defend themselves. And it really angered the Lord. King Saul was 400 years later was told to remedy that situation and wipe out the Malachites. But Saul, being a type of the flesh, could never eradicate the flesh. The flesh will never self-improve itself. And so Moses is reminding them what happened before. And so we have the event here. The Malachites, they didn't do a frontal attack. They came around. They snuck around on the back side and attacked the weary stragglers. Well, Moses says to Joshua, choose us some men and go out fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So this is the solution. The Malachites came picking a fight with Israel. They were sneaky, subtle, the way they did it. And Moses says, Joshua, you're going to confront the Amalekites. Joshua's name means Jehovah's salvation is the same as Jesus in the New Testament. And Joshua is a lovely type of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second point is notice that Israel will not battle the enemy until they've eaten the manna of Exodus 16, God's food for them, the spiritual food from heaven, and they have drank the water from the rock that God provided. And it's the same for us. In John chapter 6, the Lord says, I am the, the bread of life which came down from heaven. And he typifies himself as the manna, God's provision. Moses didn't give you manna. My father gave you manna, he said. And he was the ultimate manna. And in that chapter, he talks about, by faith, appropriating the finished work of Christ. He says, if you eat of me, speaking of believing in him, then you'll have everlasting life. And we've already looked at John chapter 7, drinking of him. The power of the Holy Spirit comes in. And so eating the bread from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, appropriating him by faith, trusting the gospel message, and having the Holy Spirit within us gives us the power to confront the flesh. And we don't read of Israel coming into any battles until they ate the manna and they drank the water from the rock, God's provision for them. Likewise, we have no power over the flesh if we're not born again and we're not spirit controlled. God does not recognize the perceived rights of the flesh. And God's people cannot battle the flesh until they've eaten of the bread of life from heaven and drank of the spiritual rock, which is Christ. So Moses says, tomorrow I'm going to be up on the hill with the rod of God that speaks of God's authority, and you're going to be below battling the Malachites. That's the plan, and Joshua obeys. Verse 10, so Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, 
and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And mark this, so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. We'll pause our reading there. So we have a double picture here of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Moses, we see the priesthood of Christ. He's up on the mount, putting his authority over the battle below. And as long as God's authority is over the battle below, God's people have success. Moses' hands get tired of holding the rod. Mo Moses is 80 years of age. I don't know if you've ever tried to hold something above your head for a very long time. Uh, I know hammering nails above my head, about two minutes. And then i got to drop my arm, let the blood flow back through before I can lift that hammer again. It takes a lot of strength to raise something above your head. And the solution was set Moses on a rock and Aaron and her come in and, and help steady Moses' arm so he holds the rod over the battle, picturing God's authority over the battle. Joshua is below with the sword and he's slicing and dicing and he defeats the Amalekites. Now, he had other soldiers with him, but scripture records that Joshua defeated Amalek. Picturing the Lord Jesus defeating the flesh. So in the New Testament, it isn't the Lord among his people, as it was here in this battle with the Malachites in Exodus chapter 17. It is the Lord within his people. So we have the priesthood of Christ in heaven. Anytime we uh, have a something that um, is testing us, we can come into the throne of grace and receive mercy and help. If it's a matter of disobedience or lusting for what's outside the word of God, God's word, it's like a javelin that should run us through. But if we have legitimate needs, then we can come to the throne of grace and receive all of the blessing that heaven can give in the situation 24 seven. It's an incredible provision that we have in our high priest, our intercessor in heaven who never sleeps, the book of Hebrews tells us. So it isn't the Lord among his people, it's the Lord in his people in the church age. And he has his intercession available for us 24-7. I think this is why the Lord Jesus told his disciples, you always ought to pray and uh, not lose heart. We have a high priest that's cheering us on. He's rooting for us. He wants us to get up in strength when we've fallen and go on in grace and finish well. And so men always ought to pray. The third point then is the victory below is determined by the intercession above. And it's true uh, in the church age. The victory here. Christ within us is determined by the intercession before the throne of grace in heaven. And God wants us to succeed and have victory. And so we need to be in prayer. We need to be drawing from him. It's only through the sword and the spirit that we can conquer the flesh, the Malachites. Verse 13, Joshua defeated Amalek. And the fourth point is the flesh must be brought under Christ's control. It must be mortified by the Spirit of God. Uh, he is the only one who can defeat the Amalek with inside us, the flesh, nature. And so, again, Joshua, the same name as Jesus, Jehovah's salvation. Uh, wonderful picture here. Although there were others that were warring with Joshua, only Joshua is mentioned as having defeated Amalek. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Just want to pick up the practical application of the sword that we're seeing here in Exodus chapter 17. There's a lovely progression in the book of Ephesians. Paul starts talking about how we are positioned in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, 6. We sit in heavenly places with him. And then he moves into the practical walk of the believer, the holy walk of the believer in chapters 4 and 5. And so we have a, a 
believers sit in Christ in heavenly places, we're to walk on the earth. It's a holy walk in the power of the Spirit. And then we're to stand, that's the key word in chapter 6, against the onslaught of principalities and powers in, in heavenly places, wickedness in heavenly places. And the only way that we have any power, spiritual wickedness in, in high places, is to get up in the high places in the heavenlies where Christ sits and draw power from him. And so we have the spiritual armor that the Lord gives us. I just want to focus on the verse 17, where it's at the end of this section on the spiritual armor. He says, and take, it's an imperative verb, so it's a command. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we, we have this spiritual armor. We have our waist girded with truth. We have our feet shod with the gospel, preparation of the gospel, with breastplate of righteousness. We have the shield of faith. We have the helmet of salvation or hope. And then we have the sword of the spirit. This sword is a makira. It's not the big broad sword that the cavalry would swing from the horses to try to remove opponents' heads. This is a 12 to 18 inch knife or short sword that hung on the belt. And this sword is controlled by the Holy Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Interesting, word is not logos, the common word, translated word in the English, but it's uh, harama, which means a specific application of truth. And so what Paul is telling us here, that when there is an attack, we need to have the word of God memorized. The Holy Spirit can call that up and use a specific scripture application of scripture to a specific cause. Sometimes people will call their Bibles my sword. Well, it is the word of God, but it's only a sword if it's rightly applied. And that requires taking a portion of scripture and having the spirit of God use that, call it up and apply it to a specific application. And so if we want to see the Lord Jesus have victory over the Malachite within, we're going to have to know the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit, being in communion with the Holy Spirit, not grieving him and quenching him through sin and disobedience, but allow the Holy Spirit then to call up the word of God and to apply specific verses and application. We see this in Matthew chapter 4 with the testing of the Lord Jesus. Three times Satan came at him. And each time the Lord Jesus disquoted verses out of Deuteronomy and defeated the enemy. He just called up the word of God and gave a specific application of it to the specific challenge that Satan had given him. And so this is how we need to use God's word. Reading it memorizing, meditating on it, being in communion with the Holy Spirit so the Spirit of God can call up the appropriate verses for every situation and deal it a, a deadly blow. Verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book, recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So there was to be a memorial in the book, recounted in the hearing of Joshua. God was going to utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. That was what he had pledged to do. And there's a coming day when 
There will not be this nasty flesh nature found anywhere on earth. During the millennial kingdom age, there still will be those who live through the tribulation, their descendants on earth, and they will have the, the nature inherited from Adam. Although there will be many glorified saints on earth at that time that will not have that nature. But in the end, when the earth is burned up with a fervent heat and there's a new heaven and a new earth, only the glorified saints will be allowed to be in the Lord's presence on his new heaven and in his new heaven and in his new earth. And there won't be any more Amalekites found anywhere. The flesh will be utterly eradicated. The lusts that oppose God ever since the Garden of Eden will be gone. And there will be no more sin. So that's the fifth point. The flesh nature will be utterly removed in a coming day. That's God's grand prerogative, his, his plan for dealing with the flesh. We read in Philippians 3.21 that... In, with after glorification, we get a Christ-like body. In a twinkling of an eye at the rapture, the dead will rise first. Those who are alive will rise, but we get a Christ-like body. It will all happen in a twinkling of an eye, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, where what was corruptible will put on incorruptible. So we'll never have another stinking thought about another sister or brother in Christ. Uh, we won't have lust for anything outside of the will of God. We will never tire of praising and worshiping our Savior. We'll be uniquely equipped for that. And so we're looking forward to uh, the glorified body. That's the completion of our salvation. When we trusted Christ as Savior, we were saved from the penalty of sin. That's the initial work of salvation in the past. And God is continuing that work of salvation by sanctifying us, saving us from the power of sin as we yield to his word and his spirit. But there's the coming of the day when the Lord's going to save us from the presence of sin. And he's going to save the body at that time. Soul and spirit are saved when we trust Christ, eternally saved. But the body isn't saved yet, but it's redeemed. And the Lord is going to come back and give us a, a body fit for heaven. And then the last point is in verse 16. Until that time, every generation is going to battle with the Amalekites. If you have children, they are born with that nature of the Amalekites within. And if they have children, they're going to have children with the nature of the Amalekites within. It passes down from generation to generation. But there's a coming day in which the Amalekites will com be completely taken care of, and there will be no more nature that sins anywhere in God's creation. And that's going to be very exciting. So at death and rapture, we escape the nature of the flesh, but it's only at the rapture of glorification when we get this Christ-like body that's prepared for heaven, uniquely prepares us to worship and praise the Lord and serve him forever. And this is God's plan for dealing with the flesh. So quick review, point one, God does not recognize the perceived rights of the flesh or the Malachites. He has his own agenda, his own way of measuring out what is right. Secondly, God's people can't have victory over the flesh until they've eaten the bread of life, which has come down from heaven and drank from the spiritual rock, which is Christ. Number three, the victory below here on earth is determined by the intercession above in heaven. Number four, the flesh must be brought under the control of Joshua or Jesus, uh, under the control of Christ. It must be mortified by the, by the sword of his word and the power of the spirit of God. And number five, the flesh will be removed in a coming day. The, that nature which opposes the things of God will be taken completely out of the way. But, number six, until then, generation after generation are going to battle the Amalekites. The good news is that in Christ, we have the ability to serve God and have victory over our flesh. We can live for him each and every day and be as profitable as any redeemed believer can be 
by yielding to the Spirit of God and His Word and joyfully going on in communion with the Lord. And there's no greater way to live this life. It's why we're here. We're only here on earth, I said it before, to make God look good for the praise of His glory. And my prayer is that through these lessons, you're a little stronger in your spiritual walk with the Lord and able to say no to the flesh, to mortify, allow the Lord to mortify, that you can go forward in strength and power and see the Malachites slain before you. Father, we thank you for our study together. I pray that you would help each one, that you've spoken to each one. Father, if there's strongholds in the mind, I pray they'd be torn down and that a new pattern of thinking, a new pattern of behavior would rule, one that pleases you. I pray, Father, that we would be active soldiers taking every thought captive to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, not allowing our imagination to go with anything that doesn't pass that Philippians 4.8 test. Lord, I pray that we would not engage in deeds of the flesh, strengthening the flesh resolve against the inner man, but rather we might feed on your word, meditate on it, be given over to it, and allowing your spirit to strengthen our inner man. So when the test comes, it is the spiritual man that wins out and not our flesh nature. Lord, we just want to live to please you. Help us to do that, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.